And we're back with the Costello Coaching Podcast. I'm here with a great friend, Dominic Papura. Um, I have a mantra that I talk to my team about on Mondays. It's called Make It Happen Monday. And amazing thing about you is you always make it happen. So six days ago, we're in Miami together. Great friends, and we'll, we'll run down that through the podcast. But we're in Miami together. We're bouncing ideas off each other and collaborating and having fun and really just present with each other. And Dom goes hey, we should do a podcast together. And I said, all right, let's do it. And a lot of times I have those conversations with people where they're like, hey, we should do a podcast together. We're having a great conversation in person. But very rarely do you actually do the podcast. So six days later, Dom and I are sitting here recording this. And it's because he made it happen. He, he decided to take a two and a half hour drive to the location, dedicate his Saturday to making the podcast happen. But I made it happen because I see what you do and I'm very impressed with, I have a lot of respect for what you have going on. Yeah. So like, it's, it's like, I feel like I'm doing this because you've earned it. Not because I, which, you know, yeah, it, it goes both ways you. though. Yeah. It's uh it's a two way street and friendships mm -hmm. are a two way street yeah. and uh, life's can be a two way street. So just hats off. I wanted to acknowledge you first before we started because, um, there's so many people that say that there really are. And they, they support me, they love me and they have great things to say, but very rarely do people go out and do it. Mm. And that small, small difference is the biggest difference. And I think it's why you're at where you are right now, heading into, um, close to your 30th birthday. Yeah. So Dom, um, former left-handed pitcher, college pitcher, uh, junior college prospect into division one, all conference, uh, pitcher of the year, Never got a chance to play pro ball, but has turned consistently has turned adversity into success. Um, always been an entrepreneur, and I'm so proud to talk about his company that he currently has is Mella. Mella Water, you've probably seen it in grocery stores. Uh, you'll see it in every single 7-Eleven coming up here in the next couple of months, uh, which we've been talking about. And he has taken something that was worth $400,000 three years ago and Latest valuation was forty million. Uh, next one coming up, I'm expecting to be a hundred million. So yep. numbers, objective data, just to kind of give you a background on what this man has been able to do in such a short period of time. But it's because he makes it happen. It's because he goes the extra mile to make the opportunities happen, and that is something that should really be studied as you listen to him talk today. You're going to hear certain aspects about his life where he had decisions. And rather than thinking that things happen to him, they happen for him, and he's made the most out of his adversity. So without further ado, Dominic Papura. Ooh, thank you. That's yeah. a really nice intro. Yeah, Amazing. no, thank it's uh, straight from the heart. And thank you for having me. I'm super impressed with everything that you've done for yourself in the last couple of years. It's very impressive at a young age, too, because I feel like it's very easy. Like, I'm sure you know what imposter syndrome is, mm -hmm. like feeling like you're not deserving of something because mm -hmm. of maybe your age or like just how fast it happens. And I think it's very impressive what you've done um, at a young age. And I I find that very inspiring. So I hope that uh, you get inspiration from me and I give inspiration from you just as much, you know, because um, it's super impressive. And it's tough, like you said, to execute. That's what nobody does. Like, I think that's so important in business and life is like everyone has ideas. And like, that's when like people come to me with ideas for years. And I used to go to people with ideas and they're like, Oh, I want to want you to sign an NDA. I'm like, you want me to sign a fucking NDA that, that an idea is nothing. Execution is everything. And most of execution is controlling what you can control and actually like doing the work. Right. Which is all in your own control. And most people just fail fundamentally at step one, you know? So yeah, the, anyway. the, I, I love what you touched on first with the imposter syndrome. A lot of young people can feel that. And I felt that, mm -hmm. um, very, very early. I felt like, how is I deserving to talk about certain things mm. or am I worthy of this or can I really charge that rate? And mm. what I did was for a long time, I actually undercharged. And what I did was I earned it to myself first. So just for perspective, before I hired a pitching coach, I did 3,500 hours of pitching lessons. So 3,500 hours, that was 3,500 lessons that I did before I hired someone to do it. So I felt like, yes, I had, I had pitched for 10, 15 years uh, competitively, and then it took me 
3,500 hours before I felt like I could coach someone else to be a coach. And a lot of times um, people try to rush through that process uh, and it shouldn't be determined on years put in. So a lot of times people feel like they've earned it after a certain amount of years. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. Well, I could sit on my couch for 10 years. It doesn't mean I earned and did anything. It's, it's how many hours have you put in, how many focused hours. Um, so I think when, when I think about you, Dom, you've put in a lot of attempts mm, at businesses. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You've tried a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's, I was sharing with Gatlin uh, about the, when we were talking about you was, and my dad. I said, you know, it's no surprise that it's happening for Dom with Mela because he's put himself through the process so many times already. Before there's a Mela, there's a Godify and there's a Wazood mm-hmm. and there's all these different business ideas because you've put yourself through the process before. So what keeps your perspective positive and open-minded when you have been through the trenches so many times? Yeah, now I know this is like a, sounds like a fugazi or like a stereotypical thing that someone would just say, but now like every time adversity or failure, I it hits me because I've, grow it, it kind of comes with the process of like you fail and then you realize after like oh my god I learned so much from that that's happened so many times throughout my life that now I almost welcome failure like every time I, I get less stressed and less down when I fail now because I understand that like that's a lesson and you have to have those to grow like I, I remember hearing a quote, like, if you're not failing, you're not doing enough or just like simple stuff like that. Like if you're not failing, that means you're not trying hard enough to even get somewhere that somebody else isn't willing to go kind of deal, you know? So, um, yeah, I failed a lot and I've invested a lot of money and I've touched a lot of stoves, which I feel like for me was something I needed to do. I feel like the best thing somebody could do is actually learn from someone else's mistakes, which is even more faster and more powerful and quicker is like, which comes from a mentor or somebody like that. I was the type of guy where I was like, I need to learn these lessons on my own. Even if somebody tells me I should or shouldn't, my heart's telling me that I need to try this. So I would do it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, failing is part of succeeding and it's, so stupid to say and because it seems like that's obvious but it's so true you know yeah and I think our identity though as ball players is comfortable with failure right right we you know, probably just, get that from being an athlete yeah know, I exactly. mean the classic the classic line of you know you fail seven out of ten times you make it to the hall of exactly, fame exactly yeah. so our mm-hmm. our identity has been built around the fact that you have to welcome and accept failure mm-hmm. in order to create success mm-hmm. and a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that you mm-hmm. know allowing themselves to accept failure and it doesn't mean that you're accepting it, that you are a failure, but that if you are putting yourself in a tough situation, you will fail. And that's okay. And being okay with that. And, you know, something that all my athletes go through before they start working with me is they go through an exam. But part of the exam is a mental emotional exam. And one of the questions on the mental emotional exam is, would you consider yourself to, or excuse me, it says, would you do you judge your process or your results? And there's no right or wrong. Um, I just like to see how people think. And some people will take that exam and they'll think about it for a second. And I stand right over them and I say, no, instinct. What's your instinct? What's your instinct on this? And most people, um, well, actually it's 50-50. And so that's the one question that always goes 50-50. The competitive question that's geared toward you know, how does your competitive mind work is, is pretty, uh, it's pretty much the same across the board is everyone answers that a, a certain way. Um, but that one question, do you judge your process or your results? That's split down the middle. So it's something I want to ask you, do you judge your process, or your results? And there's no right or wrong mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. I was thinking about it while you were asking the question. I think it's actually better to probably judge your process. The reason is because when you're going to a certain destination or a certain goal and you and you're talking about judging your process, most of your processes are in your actionable control. And so you should try to remove what you cannot control at all times. Like I literally have a tattooed on my leg, which is like, you need to be able to have the wisdom to can control what you can and not worry about what you can't. And like along the process, you can, you can control most of the things in a process. Like 
did you do your workout today? Did you eat healthy? Did you drink water? Did you call those 10 people if it's business or like these, these things that are in your control are usually in the process. And if those things are, if you're sticking to a plan, you shouldn't judge the end result. Um, and maybe along the way small, but like those, those results most likely will come from constantly reevaluating and being self-aware of what you're doing on a daily basis, which is the process. You know? Yeah, and, and results must be measured. Uh, we must be objective in what we're looking at in order to understand where we've been and where we're going. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, the best way to predict your future is look at your past because mm. we're creatures of habit and we are pattern-driven people. We repeat our patterns. So if you want to see where you're going, look at your past. So if I look at your past, think about this for a second. All right, you're a high school kid. I don't know you as a high school kid in the Midwest. You take this big leap to go to a junior college all the way out in California. You end up at Orange Coast Community College, wonderful baseball program with a great coach, a great leader. You meet some of your greatest friends at that junior college, and you win a championship, Mm -hmm. national championship, California championship, junior college championship in baseball. Then you go from there to a pretty much uh, a, a historically strong baseball program, San Diego State. Uh, you become the captain there. You become the best pitcher there, even though if we tallied up the 15 guys, you don't have the best stuff. But yeah, you, they way better talent. Way better Always talent. has been, yeah. But you, you're talented in different ways, you know, mm-hmm. areas that you can't really measure. Right. And that's interesting. And I think about it as a coach, like, how do we measure that? How do we quantify heart? How do we quantify mm-hmm. work ethic? How do we quantify that? Um, because it is very important. But – and then you finish college and you have all these great ideas and, and you put yourself through another process and challenge. I'm sure something, something along the lines of what you went through in high school, mm-hmm. what maybe drove you to go to junior college rather than a D1 right out of school. And then you have some uh, family challenges. You, you lose your father. Um, and then, boom, this, this success, what feels like, wow, did you see how fast he did it? But it, it, it accumulated over four or five years of putting yourself through it. And so I look at the results in terms of what have the patterns been? You know, the patterns have been, wow, he went through this, he created that. He went through this, he created that. He went through this, he created that. And then what you're going to notice is, okay, where those roadblocks were, what were creating those roadblocks? Were there any inconsistencies in my controllables? And if there were inconsistencies in my controllables, what kind of adjustments can I make so that I don't end up in that pattern that kind of steered me off? And how do I get more consistent towards the success that I was creating? Mm -hmm. And it can be simple for a a ball player or an athlete because you can break it down to, you know, workouts and nutrition and all these objective measurements. But in life, you know, we can't measure really our relationships. We can't measure what happens within our family dynamics. That's really deep inner work stuff. So for me, I like looking at both. I love staying process orientated, obviously, um, but I have no problem judging the results. Just judge 100 at bats Mm -hmm. before you judge 10, though. Mm. And whatever your 100 at bats are, whatever your 500 at bats, whatever your five seasons are, then you can take a real look because every year the winters are going to come, the springs are going to come, the summers are going to come, and the falls are going to come. Yeah, well, that's that's a good point you make about, like, judging the result is – I guess you're right. It is a 50, 50 answer because both are correct. Like if you're not judging your result based on like, like if you have a result that you're not, you're not being self-aware and judging and that result is 10 years away. Um, it's tough to like, you can't go back in time. So you're judging constant. So you're saying like, you'd rather judge constant smaller results to then make pivots in your controllables exactly. along the way, right? Yeah, I be accountable. I agree. Be right. accountable to your measurables, right? Right. right. And right. and that's important. A lot of people mm-hmm. lose focus on that, and mm-hmm. and sometimes they don't want to look at the hard facts of these are the numbers. And you have a CPA, you have a financial guy, you have a CFO at your at your company, and it's his job to judge those numbers and say, hey, we're spending this much, we're making this much. This is what we forecast. It's part of it. But a lot of times in life, we forget to judge our numbers Mm -hmm. and take a look at our numbers. And some people don't even track their numbers. Some people don't even know how much they weigh. Some people don't even know how much they eat. Some people don't know how much they train. And if you look at the people that do know, it's clean, it's cut, it's organized. And 
then you're more systematized and you have a chance of creating a pattern of success. And so for me, it's, it's creating the process that creates the results. You know, what's right. the process that creates the results? And I, uh, I like that. And I think it, it would be something cool for you to adapt to. Yeah, I agree. You know, I agree. And I do it naturally. So. No, you do it naturally. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't know that they do it. And I think if you become aware of what you're doing, it becomes much more powerful. Mm-hmm. Now to kind of segue into this, this topic, um, Dom is extremely charismatic, uh, light, literally lights up a room every time he goes in. And when you hang out with him, uh, his presence is really strong where Thank you feel you. like, you know, he is, he is that magnetic energy that every time you go hang out with him or hang out with a group that you're in, it's fun. And it's a fun time. And we had a great time last weekend hanging out together. Yeah. But I think one of the challenges for someone like you is maintaining your personality in a leadership role. We've talked about this before yeah. where, um, you know, a head coach of a team you could go sit down and have dinner with and he could be a great guy and you could really enjoy that person. And then you get him in front of the team and you say, man, that guy's a real dickhead. Yeah. So, I don't know what you're like with your yeah. team at Mela. I'd only assume yeah. that you maintain your personality because I've been with you in so many different situations and you're always the same guy. Yeah, I. Um, you have to have, you have to. It's not even a question of doubt. Uh, one word is an alter ego, is compartmentalization of of your, uh, your emotions, your... Um, you know, how you carry yourself depending on the situation. Right. And, and that could be done through actions. It could be done through your words. It can be done through how you carry yourself. Like your clothing could be a lot of different ways, but like I have, I am who I am in front of my whole team, my whole team. I'm the same guy at a bar as the same guy at my company meetings. I swear I, but I I'm gen. So I should say I'm authentic. Now, I also have this tiger in me to where like, if you take advantage of that, that I'm giving, loving, charismatic, I care about you, you have to be able to like turn it off and alter ego it and be like, no, that's not okay. Like I'm still your boss. Like I'm still like, you know what I mean? Like we've fired multiple people because in my opinion, they take advantage of that. And I hate to say this, but you only need, if, if there's, if you have a company of 15 people, you need to do that one time in front of everybody, which that, that person, whoever we've let go, um, we've letting a few people go. Some deserve it. Some just didn't work out from company perspective, but then they see, Oh my God. Okay. Like he's not always just fun. Like I still have to do my job, you know? Cause that's why some coaches are assholes because they may be good guys and they may be like fun people, but they know that they're players. It's not true. They just think this. They think if I'm a great guy, like my players will take advantage of that. And sometimes people do sometimes like teammates do like coaches become too easy. Then kids start slacking they get away with it. So you have to have like that good, delicate balance between being an inspiration and being a player or a, a boss or a coach that all your kids love. But then when it's time to get to work, answer the bell, like, you know what I mean? Like you got to answer the bell. And and I think that mostly comes from leading by example as a leader. Like in my opinion, leaders eat last. Like I am the least, I'm the lowest paid employee in my company right now. We have about 15 employees. I will always be the lowest paid employee in my company. Like, yeah, I have the most equity, but I, earn, I, I earned that equity. I took the risk. I made the initial investment. I made everything happen. And I will still at the end of the day, want to be the lowest paid employee in my company. Because in my opinion, why would I have money in my bank account? Like I want to take care of my family first and then I'll eat at the end. So like, I think leaders should eat last. And I think leaders need to lead by example. Like every team, they think they have like leaders fundamentally, their foundation of being a leader is like, they have to, at the end of the day, do what they're saying that they're telling people to do. Like if you consider yourself a team captain and you're slacking on your like sprints, if you're that guy who's dogging it, like why would anybody look up to you? And if they are, guess what? You're, you have, that's like a cancerous leadership environment on a team. Like we semi had that when I was in college at San Diego state, my first year, like leadership was not the hardest worker working people. So that everybody follows suit. Like you are who you are, uh, uh, like a resemblance of as a leader, you know? And then, you know, so it snowballs from there. But like, I think those two things are most important, like to be a leader is like you eat last and you lead by example, you know? Yeah. And your, your self-discipline is the, is the number one 
precursor to you being a leader. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you lack self discipline, uh, no one will follow. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what you're touching on is is your self discipline is overflowing into the into the company, mm -hmm. but then it's really interesting when you look at people that take advantage of you. Do you ever think, you know, why is that person doing that? Yeah. Um, like, do you ever think what, what, what did I do with that specific person where they felt like they could treat me that way? I have a, I have a consistent saying, you train people how to treat you. And when I work with athletes, whether it's in the gym or on the field or mentally, emotionally, there's a culture of comfort, mm -hmm. but there's an understanding of work. And it's a fine line. You don't want to be the drill sergeant because that's not where lasting relationships are built because you just have one place in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think people like us that have open hearts and really want to touch lives want to be a part of people's lives more than their boss or more than their trainer or more than their coach. You want to have a lasting impact on them. And so that's why you give them that comfort. But then where's that fine line between comfort, too hard, too shrewd, leader, friend, boss, taken advantage of? Yeah. And so that's that's something that's going to be always looked at and wondering how do I, how do I balance that? Um, but I really think about, I train people how to treat me. And if you really train people how to treat you, you'll have a better understanding on how to treat others. And then what, what is reciprocated from that? Yeah, I think the older, I think there's a lot of things to break down in your question and, and what you're unfolding. I think the first thing is, is unfortunately you either got it or you don't in terms of like, you're either greedy and you're like an asshole and you're like out for yourself or you don't. And that probably starts, to be honest, in the household from your parents, how you're raised, what they teach you, what your values are. And so as you get older, the older you get, the more you realize, like, I can't change that person. So it's more about if you get entangled with them, don't waste your energy on it. Just go, okay, that's who they are. I'm going to remember that. And then vice versa, the guys who have invested in Mela, who never ask for a fucking thing, don't care, don't care about the paperwork, don't say, oh, what's this date? I want this. I want this. They go, Dom, I believe in you. I'm going to send you $25,000. I don't care. You're going to make it happen. I trust you. I love you. Those people are all in my fucking brain. And then we have other people that are just like, not necessarily investors, but it could be anything. Could be Shit, you, you know it, the, down the list, right? People I deal with all, all the time. Um, you kind of remember that too. And you you make pivots based on yourself. Like, okay, well, I'm 29 years old. When I'm 35, I want to remember what that, that person did. And I don't want to treat someone else like that. But unfortunately, I think that's just the way the world is. Like, you can't exert all your energy trying to fix everybody else. It's just like, it's kind of like dating, you know? It's like, if you meet a girl and... Um, there's the older you get, the more you realize you have to meet somebody who matches you naturally. You can't force somebody to try to teach them to match you kind of, you know, like you have to find something that's effortless in a match, right. Or, or an energy or like you either get it or you don't. Yeah. And I think that's kind of hard for mm -hmm. myself. Um, personally is like not forcing something to happen. And if I look at my own patterns, I try to force things to happen all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And I get impatient. Well, I think it's good to try. So I think it's actually good to initiate and always, whether it's business, like whatever, you should always try to quote unquote force or like take the initial action. But if that energy or whatever isn't, isn't reciprocated, yeah. then you stop. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's always good because you want to be the lion, but like you don't want to, you don't want to go too far. Like show somebody you're a good person. If they take advantage of you at that moment, you know that you're like, well, fuck them. And you never help them again. Or like you never you've seen their true colors. You know what I mean? So those are, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, where, where did you, where did you learn this from? If you could accredit, you know, certain leaders in your life, certain figures in your life, where do you think all of these ideas were, were molded from? Because we, we acquire these belief patterns. Yeah. You know, as much as we want to believe we create them, uh, the majority of the time they're learned behaviors. So, if you could kind of label who those people are in your life that have formed you to be yeah. the dom that you are, 
Yeah, who I would think, those people be? So it's funny. My mom, you you, t- you will get what you like and you don't like for your mom and dad. You know, you take pros and cons from both or whoever it is, the male figures, female figures in your life. My mom, her best quality is she is the most giving human being on planet. She is constantly focused on everybody else besides herself. And that is an amazing quality. And I take those attributes. Are we good? We're okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an amazing quality about her. But what I learned is like she doesn't take care of herself. So like I was like, okay, I want to take that. And, you know, that what I'm saying is long story short is you take these different things from different people, you know, and implement them in your own life naturally, I suppose. But um, I think being a good person – off the bat and always always giving good energy, good vibe and love is the way to do it. But being very careful because as I go, th- it's, it's something I'm dealing with right now. It's like, as I go throughout my life, I realize there are so many people out there that wouldn't do for me what I would do for them. And that kind of, you can kind of actually evaluate your coaches or your friends, you know, like the, the guys who you grew up with, I, I'm too giving. I'm like, how can I help you? How can I help you? But like, am I sitting there going, are they thinking that about me? No. You know? So I don't know. I don't know. I think that's negative to think about, or we could talk. No, 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 no. It's not. It's important. It it just goes, it goes back to um, being Mm self-aware, you know, because you, you only have so much to pour out. Right. And, the beautiful part about us is if you're constantly pouring out and you feel like you're a little empty, you're going to go get more. And so for the people that are constantly pouring out on others and helping others and helping others, there's a point where they hit and sometimes it's rock bottom. Sometimes it's massive anxiety. Sometimes it's massive stress um, for people like us that just go all in on helping yeah. others. Yeah. And then we go to this well where we're dry. And some people are always taking it in and they can't take any more in because their glass is already so full. Yep. And it's not about finding a balance because there is no balance in this. It, I, 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 sorry to cut you off. I no. think um, one of the things I want to mention, I think one of the reasons Mel is doing so good is because it's very important for me to give and to make everyone in my company feel like this is their company. So like a, a great example is everyone in my company has equity and that is actually what you shouldn't do. You actually, sh- like, I gave all my employees equity. I never worked for a corporation, so I didn't know what vesting schedule was, which means, like, you get equity in chunks over time. Yeah. I give all my employees equity. So right that out means, of the gate? Right out of the gate. Oh, no. And I didn't know that. So, like, if I need to fire them or they're not working out, I have to fire them, but they still get all their equity. But my point is, is, like, I did that out of the goodness, goodness of my heart because I love and believe in people. And, yeah, there are people that take advantage of that, you know? And so it's like they say, there's that quote that says, I mean, it's kind of political, but not really. Is like if you're if you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative when you're old, you have no head. Because it's, it's like you want to love everyone and treat everyone. It, it's like, but the older you get, the more real you more you realize how if people see you're having success, they want to take advantage of that. They want their piece. They want their uh, credit for how you got there, right? So I think it's part of age, but I mean, how it relates to maybe your audience, I'm not sure, but. It's, I don't know, <laughs> no. just, just, just something to think about. I think giving, giving is always a good thing, but you want to make sure you're really assessing who you're giving your energy to, you know? Yeah. It can be confusing. Mm-hmm. You know, it For really, sure. it really can be because, uh, friendships are tough because you, you want to give a lot to your friends, but then if you're expecting a return on that giving, then it becomes transactional rather than you know, driven through love. And so staying in that love lane where you're constantly giving, um, but making sure that you're serving yourself in some way mm-hmm. to make sure that you're in a place to give yeah, um, is is the challenge there. So just being aware of what your challenge is and, and what, you know, you're susceptible to. And some, you know, are susceptible to, you know, um, camouflaged uh, challenges where it seems like, no, that guy's got it all covered. He's got a great company. He's doing this. But do you know how he set up his company? Th- this person could quit tomorrow and still have X percent. Yeah. And this person could backfire him. Yeah. And this person could backfire him. And, th- and it was because it all came out of a loving heart. So what you have to do is almost build an army and uh, of, of people that are completely in your corner to, to protect against that. And that's okay. That's like 
that's that's what makes you great. That is what built it so fast, and that's what what skyrocketed. But I think it's something really cool to be aware of um, is the fact that you were so giving and you were so you know charismatic in the way you you care for people. Um, and what what was your? I I never got to meet your dad. Mm-hmm. I've met your mom many times. She is she's love. Yeah, she is love. If I could put one word on her, she is love. She gives yeah. the best hugs. She is always DMing me on Instagram. Hey, that looks yeah. great. Great job. Great job. It's so you? much yeah. love. Like there is so much love from mm-hmm. her. Um, and I totally see that when I see that in you from her. But I, I'm, you know, your dad is this amazing, like uh, almost fictional character in my mind. Yeah. That, you know, where did this, where did this dude come from? Like he's, uh, he's an only child from the Midwest that makes it out to California and He's a creator. He, you're constantly creating. What What was your dad like? It was he, he a was creator, like lar- entrepreneur? Yeah, he was an entrepreneur. So both male figures in my life are entrepreneurs. My dad and my uncle, who's like my godfather. So when I was a kid, I always knew that like, I always thought about things different because I never saw my dad or my uncle work for anybody. The two men in my life, I'd never seen take orders from another man. And so like, I would constantly question normism. And growing up in Chicago, everyone does the same shit. Everyone gets married young, has kids young, lives in the suburbs, is miserable, is out of shape. I'm generalizing. But, you know, that that stereotype kind of rings true. And, and I was always thinking differently because I saw two men in my life think differently. And then I even remember, like, let's just say it's 250000 I remember asking my mom this. I was probably 15 or 14, somewhere very young, starting to figure out the world. And I was like, hey, how much does my Uncle Jim make? And she was like, oh, he probably makes around this amount. Um, and it's, in the comparable today's society, it's not that much, but I was like, holy shit, you know, it's so much money. But then I was like, well, how much does this guy make? And he worked for like a corporate company. My mom's like, he probably makes like 100. And I was like, why can't, uh, like that was yeah. my first, yeah. you know, go ahead. I no, no, like no, no. To say. No, yeah. I just, I had never like, uh, had a concept around money and how much, because it was so private in my house. Right. Like Us I still, still have Us zero still. clue, like how much my dad has made. Mm-hmm. Um, Us too. I knew that he was always the one kind of funding everything. Us too. Uh, group trips, you know, this, that, uh, whatever fee for the baseball teams. I know he was always supporting it and we would always have the team party and the nice house and everyone would always come to us. But I had no understanding of what that number was. And I think it was interesting that he raised me that way where, where the number. Yeah. I I actually, so I think when you raise your children, you shouldn't talk about money like your, how your dad is, but I think you should encourage them as they get older to talk about it amongst their friends. Because me and my best friend, Adam, he, he was raised in net, he never talks about money. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know what his dad does for a living. Like literally, like they're just super secretive. Like obviously he knows what his dad does. I'm just saying like the details or whatever. He's not in the CIA or anything. He's just like, they don't talk about religion, money. And where I grew up, no politics, no religion, no money. Like, and now that's all everyone talks about, which for good or for bad, whatever. But talking amongst your friends, that's actually a really good piece of advice fluidity of money just amongst your immediate circle how we were talking your tight friends and your boys the like the ones you love like actually talking about money is incredible is a credible tool because like me and my my best friend mike we talk about money all the time like i made like seven thousand dollars last week on just a small little deal on the side just because we're always talking about how we can make more what we can do connecting people things like that so it's like kind of like law of attraction we're always like abundantly talking about you invited into your life you're inviting it and a lot of people don't talk about it at all which i understand Uh, that's kind of like the old school conservative way for sure you know and i i think i think though if you talk about it that's the only way you learn about it exactly you got to learn about it right you got to learn about it and that's another thing bro like because you get older and you start learning about it and you start the biggest thing that broke my brain is the step one is like trading time for money Mm. that has to go. Like if you want to be successful, unless you're making $50,000 an hour doing something, which I don't know what you could potentially probably playing in the major leagues, being an all-star, like you have to make money while you sleep. So you have to start conceptualizing how you can make money outside of your time because you only have 24 hours a day. That's like something I thought about. Donald Trump's a good example. It's like, I was like, this guy's a billionaire 
and I'm me, but we have the same 24 hours in a day. So how does, what does he do in that 24 hours to grow wealth? Or maybe he's not a good example, anybody, right? Everyone has the same 24 hours in a day. So like trying to figure out what, how they use their time is super important. And then also like a big tip about success is like, Ed Milet said this at a conference and it changed my fucking life. Like just this little analogy. When you go to school your whole life, they teach you don't cheat. Like cheating on your neighbor's test is bad, which it is. Like you don't want to cheat when you're in school. I totally agree. But in success and business and life, cheating, because you go to the school system your whole life, cheating is kind of like a bad thing. Duplicating exactly what someone who's more successful than you do is the exact surefire way of how you can become successful. Like if you find a guy who's exactly where you want to be, let's even say he's 10 years ahead. You want to talk about the process, Rinse figure out it. every fucking thing he does in his day and how he thinks about problems and money. And if you can be around that and like ask him or literally duplicate it, it's literally just a, mat a matter of time before you get to that level, if not faster, because it took him a long time to learn that system. But yeah, Ed Milet said, he's like, if you want to become successful, find out who someone successful is and just copy them, you know? And like, it's, it, I don't know why it just clicked with me. I was like, that's so true. Like, so was your, was the coconut water, Jesse Itzler kind of a motivation for Mella? No, I, uh, I didn't cut. No, not really. Um, when I was getting the beverage game, it was, so I, I self-analyzed why I like beverage. Like we were talking about in Miami, like some people say, do what you love. And I do agree with that. I also think do what you're really good at because then you will love it if you're good at it. Um, so whether it's selling concrete, but like, you're just good at that, you'll eventually fall in love if you're really good at what you do. And then you can kind of, so beverage and CPG has a couple of fundamental things that I love. Reoccurring revenue, I think is really great. So, you know, you get Mela in one store, as long as it sells, you're making money on that every day. So then let, let's say you, let's say you sell one can per day per store. And let's say we make $1 per can. So we basically make a dollar per store. I'm thinking about the math. I'm like, okay, well, if I get in a hundred stores, that'll take me two weeks. Now I'm making a hundred dollars a day. And then on and on and on and on. And then as you build that, it's like this snowball effect of reoccurring revenue. I loved that. I love, is it that simple? Yeah. It's that simple. And then figuring out, you know, you go in more depth as what stores sell best. So like you, you put, let's say you start a brand and you put it in 10 convenience stores, 10 grocery stores, 10 coffee shops, whatever different channels, fitness gyms like this, figure out what of those channels, if anything, is actually a, a data wise selling more than others. Then you kind of lean more into that. And then you literally could just go store by store by store by store by store to get your first, you know, you could get a first thousand accounts on your foot. And then once you do that, then you get a distributor and then the distributors have sales reps. Then you can incentivize them $15 for every store they get. Now you got 50 sales reps, you know, it just snowball effect, you know, and then making pivots based on where your product sells best is like, that's how essentially I got into this game and Mello is blowing my expectation out of the water. But, you know, like you saying, you, you, you focus on your reverse, in my opinion, another piece of advice would be reverse engineer your big goal down to the day, you know? And that takes an hour, two hours of just planning. Like I'll tell you, I'll just give everybody, we, we should clip this. Like my, um, my goal is I was like, okay, I want to make, I want to, I want to retire with $40 million in my bank account. Okay. Screw taxes. Let's take taxes out of the equation. Let's say it didn't exist, but just as, as a simple exercise, I want to make $40 million. Okay. Well, if I have a business that is going to sell at a 4X multiple. That means I got to get a business to 10 million in revenue. Okay. How much is that a month? 10 million, 10 million in revenue. I think it's like $800,000 a month, something like that, right? $800,000 a month. Then you break it down to the day or the week, the day, et cetera. And then you build out a plan of ramping to get there over three years. And then you build out the actionable items that you can do today to lay that brick and it's going to take you months, if not years, to start to see the foundation growing. And it's going to be fucking frustrating, but that's what you learn in sports. Is like, even if you don't see the, the results, if you're, if you're focused on the process, the results will eventually come. It's like dieting, anything, right? So 
I think the best way to do it is you, you figure out your angle. Where do, how many houses do I like be very specific? Like how much money do I want to make on interest a year? How many houses do I want cars? Where do I want to send my kids to school? Whatever the fuck the goal is exactly where you want. And then you just simple fly. You just reverse engineer it. And then like Mela is doing better than I had projected. Like now it's getting to the point where I, I need to maybe once every quarter revert to my goals and make small pivots. But I basically know it's secondhand nature, what I need to do for Mela every day to move closer to that goal. And now we've, I mean, it's crazy. Like I have, I don't have a hundred percent equity in Mela anymore, but if we sold tomorrow, we could probably sell for $40 million. So getting there is all attainable. It's just reverse engineering, I think is the most powerful tool when you want to get down to what actionable items you can do every day, you know? What brought you to the 40 million? Um, I just looked at like, okay, I want, you know, want to pay my mom's house. I just did like bullshit math with millions. Like, okay, I want to spend a million on my mom's house. I want to have a $2 million, $3 million house in California, condo in Miami, couple cars, couple million for spending. I want to have 20. I, I calculated. I'm like, okay, I want like $150,000 a month on interest. So I need to get that, you know, 25 million in the bank. So I just, just like some, and it's all Fugazi and yeah, you want to dream big, you want to shoot big, but I just it's came up though. with my ideal life. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's really not. not because, it's not. because which we should talk about this too. Um, crypto. I mean, when you, so there's two things to note. Okay. One thing that should scare the shit out of you is when you get to that goal, let's say it's 10 million. You're like, I want $10 million. Do you know how much fucking money you have to make to save $10 million? Okay. So taxes are going to take 30%. Your cost of living is going to go up. You're going to get the Range Rover. You're going to get the nice house. You're going to get the girlfriend. You're going to do the dinners. So my point is like $250,000. If you make 250 grand a year, do you know how long it would take you to make $10 million? It's like, insane. It's like, I don't even think you ever could do it. So my point is, is you have to constantly assess the vehicles that you're putting your cash in on the side to grow while you're sleeping, right? Which crypto I think is a great way. Stocks, bonds. I don't know as much about stocks. I love crypto, but crypto was the first eye-opening experience of my life to where I'm like, okay, somebody, I made uh, what was it? seven figures in crypto. And it was the first time in my life. I'm like, Somebody who's making 200, because at the time I was making 70 grand a year working for somebody else, but I made what would have taken somebody who made 250,000, 10 years I made that. It would have taken somebody who's making 250 grand about 10 years in savings to make what I made in one year in multiplication of money. So multiplying wealth is something that on the side, when you're sleeping, you're at night, you stick to your game plan, you stick to your, what you can control, but constantly be spending that extra time, whether it's YouTube videos, listening to people, try to sift people out that are bullshit, but like studying, you know, if I have 10 grand, but I have an asset that could appreciate over three X, four X, you know what I mean? Those type of things, right? Yeah. I think it's what really you're talking helpful. about is studying your market, studying the market. Yeah. And not the typical market of, you know, stocks and this and that. I, I think it's important if you want to have success in any marketplace, you study your market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. to simplify this yeah. in the world that I live in with mentoring uh, high school and college and professional baseball players, I let high school players know that you're entering a marketplace. And they say, what's a marketplace? Mm, it's in a like marketplace that. where goods are exchanged. So like that. what happens in a marketplace in college baseball is there's money made there. And there's money spent. So if you want a scholarship, that's $200,000. Now, how much value do you need to bring to that mm, marketplace to like be worth $200,000? Yep, yep. And then it makes it very clear. Oh, well, someone who receives $200,000 typically has these metrics. They run this fast. They throw this hard. They hit this well. They, this is what kind of leader they are, they are on their team. This is how they carry themselves. And then you just break it down so simply. Well, now you get into more of a complicated world, a crypto world or a business world that doesn't seem so cut and dry. You dumb it down. And, and the smartest people in the world can make complex ideas sound simple. That's the true essence of someone that's a genius. Mm -hmm. Take the most complex idea and make like it sound that. simple. And for you, when you're talking about 
crypto and you're explaining your success in a complicated game, what you did was you went through a process and you understood the marketplace Mm -hmm. and you understood that, oh, wait, the people that have a lot of money, what do they do with their money? Oh, they do this and yeah, they can do that. Yeah, I made it that. more simple. Exactly. You, I've always been good at macro things. Like I'm actually made a hundred grand when I was in high school, um, off four to five thousand dollars and uh, stocks, and I was doing it in a in a class because I was thinking macro. Like I was like, okay, this was in 2011. People started smoking weed. Obama. I lived in Chicago. I knew Obama was going to get reelected. Uh, he's a Democrat, and I was like, okay, Democrats are going to uh, finally legalize weed. So I put $4,000 in a crypto stock in a way. My point is, is like so many people, especially when they're really intelligent, they overcomplicate things so much to where like really it all comes down to simplicity. And I, yeah, I liked what you said with, um, yeah, with that, you know, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. A true genius can make complex sound simple. Yeah. And, and, um, one thing too, that I, I would love to, give everyone a heads up, like from the athlete world is like, if you're transitioning a business, the hardest thing that you're going to face is when you, when you're an athlete, all the things we just talked about in this podcast, like you're putting in all the work, right? You're going to get a result. And that result is going to be published in a number. Mm. Okay. You put in the Tommy Costello, let's say the diet workout, whatever, you're going to see your batting average go from 230 to 280. And Mm -hmm. you're going to know what you're doing is working. When you get to the real world, that shit doesn't exist. When you're a pitcher in college, you have a win-loss record. In the real world, you don't get that. So it's very difficult to articulate if what you're doing is successful, besides like the money in your bank. But like we talked about, sometimes that comes, you could be working your ass off for 10 years and never have that dollar sign in front of your bank account. I still don't have it. Like in net worth I am, but I don't have that money in my bank account. So That's one thing mentally to prepare for, to get ahead of the curve is like, how am I going to, you have to create, my point is, is you have to create those wins and losses for yourself Mm. because San Diego state baseball.com isn't showing Don Papura's win loss record, which is attributing to what he's doing when no one's paying attention in the real world. You got to be working when no one's paying attention and nobody's going to know your results for decades potentially. So that's another reason, though, why athletes could have more success than a normal person, because everyone listening to this podcast, you're preparing right now for all that shit you're doing when no one's watching to have those results. And nobody else outside of the athlete world really does that. You Mm -hmm. know, now, tactically speaking, Mm -hmm. what kind of principles have you laid out in your life? What are your win loss records? Yeah. So I what you can control, Uh, Jim, eating. Um, cardio, um, let's say it's, uh, showing up to every meeting, right? Like, uh, the, the basics things you can track, sing, things you can contract, can yeah. track. And now it's tough for me because I have a massive team. So I actually don't know that yet. I'm like constantly reassessing too quickly now, but especially early in business, I actually, I actually just had a calendar on my wall and it was just my win loss calendar. And to qualify for a W, I had six different things that would qualify me for a W to win the day. And my goal was to just win six out of seven days. I could take a I could take a loss for a day. It's okay. Balance sometimes, relax. And I knew that if I compiled, just focused on today, and then I compiled a week, a month, et cetera, like you talk about, I've heard you say, eventually you win the month. And if you win enough months, you win the year. And if you know it win enough years, you win at life, you know? Um and it's so true, like bo- boiling it down to what you can control from a day. But yeah, you have to come up with it yourself. You know, no one's going to tell you. So something that we're about to touch on uh, that we never dove into, uh, we got a little distracted by the love of your mom. <laughs> uh, you, you were kind of going on about uh, your, your, was it your uncle that was making 250K? Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. And, and you started to, qu- you started to connect, you know, what 250K looked like in a life. You know, what did, okay, that number is on a digital screen, but that translates to this kind of lifestyle. And, and that's what everyone's looking for is a a lifestyle. You know, they want to live a certain lifestyle and that's why people work to make money really. Um, and what, what was your, what was the, the character traits that your dad carried, um, that, that made him you know, courageous enough to be an entrepreneur because it takes, it takes courage to do that. Yeah. So my dad was not a good entrepreneur. So I learned a lot about what not to do in business from him. Like 
he was an amazing guy and he was articulate and he, um, you know, he was, he was, he was organized, but he lacked some other things. And actually it goes so much further than just my family tree. But what I've, I learned from him, my grandpa was very successful. So my dad, I think would have been more successful had my grandpa not been successful. My point is, is usually stereotypically, and it's kind of true if you are born into wealth or you're born into a comfortable situation, you don't have that fight or flight mentality. And I've always had the dog in me and I've always had the, um, the grit, but really the biggest lesson I got actually from when my father died was I just realized this within the last year. I was actually on another podcast where I realized it. I was like, I would not be where I am right now. Had my dad not died because I lived in a comfortable environment. So I always knew I could go home. And like when my dad passed away, subconsciously, I never thought about this for years, but I never had, he, he took away my plan B. Like your whole life when you're growing up, you're like, well, if I go broke, I could always count on my dad or my mom, you know? And like, he was always my safety net. And when he died, my safety net was gone. And like, so it turned me into a fucking savage. Like there's so many moments around Mela and so many times that I've actually been down with previous companies that I knew I would have maybe folded because, and I, and I remember in those moments, I'm like, I got no plan B. I have to execute. I have to push through. And like where, when he was alive throughout my entrepreneurial journey, I might've called him and asked for like a bailout. Like he wasn't rich. You know, he was just a normal Midwest guy probably had like, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but very, middle class in the Midwest, not even middle class in California, like middle class Midwest. So my problems were never big enough to not be covered by him. But you get my point is like, um, the biggest, the biggest like depression in my life was formed into this savagery, which is just like no plan B all in execute, and, and I tried to do that knowing at the same time that I could go back to a smaller lifestyle, like a nothing to lose mentality, underdog mindset, like constantly, like I not, not saying this, but like, fuck you, I'm coming for it. Let's go, you yeah. know? And, and yeah. that's deleting, that's deleting that imposter syndrome. Yes. You know, exactly, claim, yeah. claiming you you have a self, uh, yourself, you're claiming that this can't happen. And this is a reality that I can't create. And until you get to that point, and a lot of people, it happens where you have nothing else to lose. So you create it. But a lot of people stay in that middle ground with, ah, I'm not sure. You know, I don't know if you ever get in a cold tub, but you never feel like getting in a cold tub. And then you get in and then you get out and you're like, yes. That was amazing. Yeah. You know, but mm-hmm. there's so many people that don't even get in. Mm-hmm. And then there's people that get in halfway. And then there's people that just dunk their freaking head in. And the people that are willing to dunk their head in and just go through it, they get out and they feel so much better right away. And so finding whatever that thing is that creates you to get in it and go for it, that's where you need to be. If you want true greatness and if you want to truly test yourself. Yeah. And what you're doing by leading people and having employees and having a business and and having people at 7-Eleven counting on your product and you're having people at... Distribute, uh, distributing centers counting on your product, what you've done is you've, you've asked for more and people are requiring more out of you and there's more to give, but there's only so much DOM. So it's how do I create uh, more specific goods? So how do I create more specific greatness? And, and how do I get really clear and concise on what I am creating, what I am giving? And it kind of relates back to um, your, your overabundance of sharing love and being careful and calculated with how much love you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Because early on, you just wanted to give it all, but now you have to be very calculated on how you distribute that love. Um, So I'm I'm really interested in what the next five years look like for you. Yeah, me too, bro. Me too. And I'm very blessed and very thankful um, to be, like, just to be here. Like, I think, you know, luck is when hard work meets opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think there's an element of what happened with me and what's happening with Mello where it's lucky. And right place, right time, right fruit. Yeah, but you created it. But I created it, right? But you have to take that action for that to happen. Like, 
J. Cole, I always, me and my buddy always say this, like, J. Cole has a line, if you ain't going to take a chance, how the fuck are we going to get rich? Mm. And it's so true. Like, if you do not attempt, you cannot score. Like, you have to attempt. And you might attempt, and you might shoot the best shot of your life, or you might miss, and then you learn again. But if you attempt and you attempt, like, if you keep going, you can't. It's impossible to fail. Like, you know, you literally, if you fail enough times, you will succeed on one. All it mm. takes is one. All it takes is one, you know? Some I, people do that, don't learn that till they're 40, but, yeah. you know? I think that's the that's one of the greatest things that I'm doing that sometimes I don't give myself credit for is the attempt at creating something, you know, starting yeah. starting at, at zero and just creating something and going through that process of, all right, what does this look like? And knowing, by the way, knowing that trading time for money is stupid mm -hmm. and accepting that because I wanted to do something that I loved mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn how to create a business out of that. And I knew that, you know, the ultra wealthy are just a little bit more creative. Exactly. Yeah. And because everyone mm -hmm. has relatively at, at, at the one percenters and the five percenters of the world, relatively the same skills. You know, if you get to the top 5%, which I already am at, um, in terms of income, yep. uh, you uh you have pretty much the same skills it's the going into the 0.01 percent you're just that much more creative well i think you said when we were talking in miami you you have you're self-aware of like your current situation is not your end goal mm -hmm. and you're you're constantly being creative of how can i scale my time mm -hmm. and get you know like with your app and you guys have all this great stuff going on with your app and you're starting to grow subscribers and no one's really thinking about that but like what else could you do could you have uh, could you charge uh, a thousand players, college and high school kids, uh, ten ten dollars a month, and then one day a month, Aaron Judge is joins your app and is, goes live for an hour, and people can ask him questions. And they have to pay money to ask those questions, like mm -hmm. on a live feed, but just to be able to listen in on what his advice is is ten dollars a month, and sure. you have one. Like, there's so many different ways. That, like, Double you know, your income. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, exactly. Or just being an entrepreneur, thinking outside the box. Yep. And and two, you know? the cool process about that, and not to get too long winded on it, is allowing yourself to go through that process of being ultra creative and trying things, and then scrapping them. Mm. And yes, that's what I've yes, gone through this yes, year. So yes. to start twenty twenty three, I was like, all right, we're going all in on this, and we have five x what we started at, and going through the process of these are my products, this is what I do, and then saying no, no, no. Refi refining it to be more simple. No, this is what we do. This yeah. is our small, medium, large. Yep. And this is exactly who we're serving. And this is how we do it. And these are the systems. And so giving ourselves time and a grace period in order to institute those and see what works and see what makes the biggest impact. And the where I want to close it is a is a complex topic that I want to hear your opinion yeah, on. Yeah, I have no time. If you guys have no time, we can yeah, talk no. all night. I don't give a shit. Okay. So go ahead. Marketplace value versus inner value. And why I ask about that is because marrying the two is typically what people who have big hearts always aim to do when they've already accomplished their marketplace. Meaning, you look at the, I'll use my dad as an example. His inner values didn't really align with insurance. But his inner values drove him to create one of the best insurance companies, mm -hmm. to sell this insurance company, to accumulate a lot, whatever yep. that number is. And then, you know, he's 56, 57, 58. He's going through this process of, all right, how do I share my inner values with others? How do I coach? How do I teach? How do I mentor? And that's what he aligns with internally. That's what wakes him up. That's yeah. what drives him. Yeah. And it's not really attached to a number value. And, I see a lot of men do this and women too. They, they go out into the marketplace that doesn't have really any co uh, connection to what kind of drives them internally, but they go create an abundance. And then once the abundance is created, they find a way to give it away. And then they give away their knowledge and their intuition and yeah. their spirit to others, which fuels people. And then that's kind of why they were doing it in the first place. And so what I've challenged myself to do is align my marketplace value with my inner values. And that's been my biggest challenge. It's okay. How do I do this? How do I go about this without an ego? How do I go about this where I'm taking care of myself? How do I go about this 
where I'm building a business, where I'm not being taken advantage of. And then, all right, well, I really want to help that person, but does it cost this or does it not cost this? And all these questions go through my head all the time, but it's because I'm playing a tennis match between inner values and marketplace value. So where, where do you stand on that topic? And if you've ever thought about it, um, because Gatlin, who we both know and love, who's been on the podcast, shared that, and I, I kind of called him out for it. I said, every time you post a video that aligns with your inner value, it blows up. And it might be that one that feels a little bit mm, politically driven, or it might feel a little controversial, or it might feel faith-based when the algorithm doesn't want you to do that. But all of a sudden, those are the videos that dominate your marketplace are the ones that are completely aligned with your inner value. So as you're building this business, you're, you're driving your inner values into the marketplace. And I think your values are so strong. That's why the company's so strong, but maybe it's something that you think about in the future. Or if you have uh, an immediately immediate thought on it, what, where does that kind of take you? Uh, I don't know how your values would connect to your marketplace value, but what I would say about your values is you should always just be authentic unless you're a piece of shit person, right? Um, but you should just always be authentic and the right people will find you and determine your value, I feel like, based on what authentic uh, things you're putting off, if that makes sense. Like, never really, if you're a good person, you know you're a good person. If someone doesn't like you or something, it's like, try to let that go in here, one out the other, and just be authentic to what you like, you know? Even if you are authentic, though, what kind of value are you providing to others? Oh, um... Like, what, what, do, you what, what, what do you think, this is a good question for you. Sure. What kind of value do you bring to someone's life where they want to get behind you, they want to work for you? What kind of value are you showing up good, to the door? Yeah, with? good question. Uh, energy, and number two is knowing that I will have their back. Like, I will take the bullet in front of them for them, and, like, I will lead by example, right? So those are, like, values that I was saying earlier that are, So it's like, like compassion. Fundamental, yeah. Compassion and energy and, yeah. So those, I, I don't know Risk if those are taking? values. Risk-taking? Um, in terms of what my employees would be, no. No, because what I'm saying is a lot of times, you know, we, we've talked about that people don't like taking risk. So the value that you bring is you're a risk taker. Oh, yeah. Yes. And they want to they get behind you because yes. they know that you'll take the risk. And if shit hits the fan, you'll wear the bullet for them. And I think that's why a lot of people are attracted to you. For example, Miami. Yeah you bring up this topic of Uber package or this concept of Uber package, <laughs> yeah. no clue what this is. Yeah. And I was willing to take a half risk on it. You know, I might oh, say, yeah, yeah, your backpack. It, yeah, yeah you might say something about me. Left your luggage, yeah. I left my luggage because yeah. there was like, I don't know, maybe 500 top, bucks worth yeah. of uh, clothes in there. Okay. Right. But I knew that my business was riding on this laptop. And if I didn't have my laptop for this flight home, I was losing like $10,000 worth of work that mm -hmm. I needed to do. So I, I, yeah, I knew the laptop cost this much. I knew that these notes cost this much and blah, blah, blah. Hmm. And the value of the backpack. But I said, hmm. the value of my time, I'll fucking exactly. wear, the, I'll wear the backpack because I, I can't have this laptop go missing and ship to me because I need this five hours on the plane to get this work done. And that's why I kept my backpack. But you were the leader of the tribe. And you're like, no, guys, this is what we're going to do. There's this thing called Uber package. We're going we're gonna to put the uh, luggage in here. We're going to call it from the stadium. It will arrive. We'll get our stuff. We'll get in the Uber. And then we're going to go to the airport. Yeah. And that's how we're going to do it. And everyone goes, okay. Yeah. I, am, I realize this right now for the first time in my life. One of probably my strongest attribute, I am incredible at decisive risk oh, analysis. I love it. Yes. <laughs> I am incredible at risk analysis in fucking credible. Like for Mello, we're looking at bringing on a face of the celebrity of a brand within two seconds. Somebody who probably is a consultant who pays brands, pay him fucking 200 grand a year. I can make a risk assessment on whether that person would be good psychologically sales wise, everything I can run through that in a second and make an analysis of like, this person could work. This would not. I'm you the know? same way, like, dude. Give you a million example. This is last week. Like, we're looking at signing a celebrity. Um, Becky G, the Latin singer, or Bad Bunny. Within two seconds, no one taught me this. My risk assessment goes off and goes, okay, well, Becky G's a girl, 
And men don't buy women's products, but women buy men's products. No one's ever told me that. It's just my gut feeling. And that's a correct answer. Like, and I can make a $5 million executive decision on not to execute on something quickly and easily. And it goes down to Uber package. And that's why I take a lot of risk because I assess how, how, how I, I mostly assess, uh, how likely is this to fail and what's the loss going to be? And if that combination is both, like you take it all day, you know, because how much we saved an hour of our time. Actually, we saved a shitload of money because Uber package was $15, you know, and then we had the Uber to go to the field or the airport. Yeah. yeah we so paid him, I am an incredible paid cash risk and we, analysis. we save money there too. Yeah. You have to take risk, like whether it's talking to that girl or like, you're always going to be sad you didn't. You're not going to ever be, bro, if you fucking spend your whole life shooting and when you go to die, you're not going to be like, damn, I wish I didn't try. <laughs> you're going to literally do the opposite. If you die, bef you're going to lay and you never shoot. You're going to live your life. I think regret is the most painful fucking bill you'll ever get in your life. Like regret of not taking the risk and not taking the chance is so much worse than failing and being like, well, oh, I fucking shot my shot. Like girls is an easy example. How many times you see a girl that you want to talk to and if you don't go up to her, you're like, damn, like what if? But if you go up to her and she's got a boyfriend, it's like you don't even remember she exists 10 minutes from now because you're like, I shot my shot. I tried. It's all good. Like no problem. There's more. You know what I mean? Yeah. You'll always regret not trying. Yeah. And where do you feel on calculated risk? Like, meaning the, mm. the Bad Bunny example, where how much you saved by not making the decision and being okay not making a decision. Because a lot of times people can uh, misinterpret what you're saying yep. for always do it. You're not saying always do it. You're, always, you're saying always have the understanding of what could be the worst to happen and then make your decision based off if you're okay with that happening and then go from there. Am I, am I accurate? Because when you, yeah. cause say you spent, you, say you took a risk, right? On, on a, I'm thinking, a yeah, celebrity and yeah. a celebrity endorsing uh -huh. it. And then you, you take that risk and it derails the company for three quarters, you know, because it was a large financial commitment. Now one could say, Oh, it's a risk. And that's a, that could be a good thing to happen. And I'm going to go for it because I'm a risk taker. Yep. You're not saying that you're saying, okay, well, uh, you're thinking about what the worst outcomes could be and if you're willing to take on those outcomes. Yeah, I would say most of the things I do in my life, I actually execute on the risk because usually, like I said, the cons actually never outweigh what the potential pros could be. Like like we were talking about investing earlier, okay? Let's look at Bitcoin, okay? If you have $100,000 and you put it in Bitcoin and it succeeds, the, the risk of it succeeding compared to the risk of loss is far better to take that opportunity than not. Because, so I mostly execute on these risks. Like Bad Bunny's a great example. He's $5 million. We don't have $5 million, but I know that if he wanted 5 million and he said, yes, I will go make, I will go find and create $5 million out of thin air to make that deal happen. Because that would double the overall value of, that would triple the overall value of the company overnight. So $5 is actually $0 in risk, in my opinion, because just off sales and brand awareness, you know, or not he, zero, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? That makes sense. Like I'm, I'm more, I'm, I usually take, I'm a high risk taker, but I don't, I have to admit to brag about myself. I don't usually fail on my risks very seldom. And when they do, they're not that big, you know, well, you, once in a while, you, uh, but, you bought, Bitcoin, uh, you bought, uh, crypto for me one mm -hmm. time and, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my money tripled <laughs> yeah and then and then it started to crash and then once it was doubled i was like all right i'm i'll take my take i'll take my double yeah and but i remember sitting in the in the cabin we were snowboarding and when i was yeah, sitting in the yeah, cabin yeah. and he broke it down for me and i was like all right it makes sense i got i got that much like yeah a couple couple grand yeah yeah, yeah. like what could you lose a couple yeah. grand what could you gain Endless. Yeah, I know. And you then know? your way, like your way of convincing me that um, was was out of love. It wasn't out of like fear for me that, you know, a lot of people can misconstrue that into fear based decision and you make it a love based decision, yes. which I think is why people listen to you. And I was going to ask you that, but I just gave you the answer. I was going to ask you, why do you think people trust you to make those group decisions? 
it's like it's really interesting concept to think because you have to go introspective on yourself and understand what what energy am I putting out there where people are just bought into me? Well, I think it's I also take accountability for things I don't do right, like some like narcissistic. Oh, oh the Air, Airbnb. Exactly. You're like, right. nah, I'll fucking wear it. I'll wear it. <laughs> right, and it wasn't even a bad decision or no. a risk, right? But yeah. I'll I'll actually. Oh, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'll, I'll be like, oh, but I But then people up. trust you. Exactly. Because you you, you, you take, take accountability Because some guys, action. like, or some people that are narcissistic, they'll be like, well, you believed in me, like, yeah, yada, yeah. yada, yada. They don't take accountability. Or I'm going to charge you for this because we all said we were going to... Right, right. We all said we are going to do it right. So, and... There's certain guys that yeah. you, you know these guys. I know these guys. You're one of these guys. I'm one of those guys. They always come through. Maybe not right on time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know they're just yeah. going to come through. Yeah. It's like a pitcher out on the uh-huh. mound. Like, he could be out there for, you know, first three innings of the game. He's given up four runs. And you're like, man, like, it's not going to be his best stuff. But I, I got this belief he's going to come through. And you look up, and it's the ninth inning, and he's still in the game. And you're winning five to four. And he's just dug in and figured it out from the third inning on. Mm-hmm. And I think that's uh, – I think that's you. Yeah, I try to be somebody who is a man of their word. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Like, and uh, I think there's nothing worse than people who constantly say, like, I got one buddy. We can't clip this for my social media, but I got one buddy, all the talent in the world. This guy should be mega famous. I don't think you know who he is, but he has every fucking tool to do that. And he, all of his friends have given him the advice he needs or the time he needs or whatever. And he doesn't, he doesn't take, he doesn't follow through. He says he's going to do something. So yeah, I mean, this being somebody, I try to be somebody who always says they're going to, says they're going to do something. They do it. You know, I've, I'm going to fucking run a marathon. I'm going to do it. I'm going to build a hundred million dollar company. I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? That's yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in a similar spot. I'm, I'm running a triathlon October 1st because nice. it's coming up. Yeah. It is a triathlon. Uh, what is the triathlon? Yeah, like, like well, swim in the ocean, ride well, a bike. Well, yeah, but I'm saying like, what are the swim is one mile, bike yep. is 25. Yep, and then how much uh, is run? Uh, I think like 10. Nice. So it's going to be a grind. The only reason I'm doing it is because I've never done anything like that. Yep. And I can dominate anyone in the weight room. I can dominate any type of you know uh, routine, whatever. But it's so out of my league to do this. So I said I'm going to do it. And when I signed up for it in March, uh, there was an option where you could pay an extra 25 bucks uh, to get your return on money if you didn't end up showing at the race. Oh, and you said no. I said, fuck no. Yep. Because it was like, I'm not going to give myself the out. Like, I'm going to go yeah. do it. Even if I'm, you know, out in the ocean, someone's got to pick me up in a boat because you know, I can't swim the whole mile. I'm going to go do it. And then I just find little pockets to train for it because what it is is I just want to use October 1st as a mindset day where I say, all right, I'm going to do my best to do this. And my win is completing this. It's not, I'm not training for this because I'm an, uh, I'm a triathlete. You know, I'm doing it for a hard October 1st and I'm going to so, be aware that this is coming. Yeah. Up. Is your goal to, and this is your first one, is your goal to kill it and pay attention no. to your numbers or just complete it? Mine, do when it. I did my marathon was just complete. It. Yeah, do it. One advice I have for you, which worked out for me in my marathon is when I showed up, I was half asleep. When you show up, be half asleep. Don't fucking, I mean, eat your food, do whatever you have to do, but never truly wake up and get amped. Like I'm going, You'll lose try energy. to keep your heart rate low and literally pretend like you're, I remember at the marathon, I, I just tried it. No one ever even gave me that advice. I ran 13 miles before I was even awake. And I was like, all right, it was, it was almost like stretching or like how much I felt like I have energy. I exerted like warming up or like hyping myself up that adrenaline that just at 13 miles, I then started. It was like, you know, that's like good if, advice. If you're Let in the, the water, swim obviously it's cold. Yeah. What, what, what comes first, second, third? What is it? It's a swim, bike, run. Swim, bike, run. Okay. But even when you're swimming, like keep your heart rate low. Yeah. Don't try to go crazy and just, like, you know, what's cool about the ocean, world. the ocean, like freaked, uh, you know, it can be, can be pretty intimidating. I, I was swimming in Miami and the water was warm and the waves were small and it was pretty easy. And just, uh, before we went out to the game, I, I swam, I think three quarters of a mile, nice, which was great. And, but you go into the ocean in, in Malibu and, and the water's cold, the it's waves free. are big. Yeah, that's true. And it's a good, it's a good challenge. I put the goggles on one morning. I, I wanted to go out for a swim and see what it felt like. And, and it was dark 
and the water was dark and the waves were hitting me and there was no lifeguard and you start having conversations with yourself. (laughs) And I was like, damn, this is, this is a really good place to learn a lot Mm -hmm. about yourself and going for runs and starting to, you know, talk to yourself on runs and it's a really good place to get your, get yourself. Have you ever run before in a marathon? No. So you've never done any group Dude, the runs? Most, the most I've run in my life in distance, the mm-hmm. furthest I've run is four miles. And how much is it? 13 miles? No, it's 10. 10? Well, I'll tell you what. Another thing you're going to find, which I almost don't want to tell you this, but I'll tell you because it's so interesting. 10 miles is going to be easy as shit. Guess why? Guess why it's going to be the easiest 10 miles you ever fucking ran in your life. Take a wild guess. I'm competing? Um, kind of. It's easy because everybody around you is simultaneously running because they don't want to let the next person down. And it's this like nucleus of like everyone's energy. not stopping because the person in front of them's not stopping, but they're not stopping because of the person in front. And like they're all tired of shit. Yeah. When if you train on your own, you quit. Not quit, but like you'll stop, stop and take a walk or whatever. Like, and then to add to it for you, the people to your right and left, some of them are going to be in their 60s. They're going to be women, a lot older. And be like, they're not stopping. I got to keep up with them. Yeah. And they're not stopping because the per. you know what I mean? It's like this collective domino of this like nuclei of just like people continuously hurting mm. together. When if you break all those people up individually, they probably all would have quit by now. Yep. You're going to experience that. It's going to be really wild. You're uh, not going to have no year in the tank. Like yeah. no year in, you have that in the tank. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, you. I'm very excited for it. And there's gonna be people cheering yeah. and shit like that. Yeah, it'll be cool. It'll be cool. Yeah. And we're getting in. Uh, I'm, I'm getting in the ocean. I'm gonna swim. It's like, it's, uh, it will be good. And you know, it was funny. I, I was talking to a guy about prepping for the triathlon. He's like, oh, so you got the wetsuit, you got the bike, and mm-hmm. no. He's like, well, how have you been training? I said, I just get in and I swim. I, I was gonna wear some board shorts and just go, yeah. go for the swim. Should do that. Yeah, just fuck it. Fuck it, dude. I know. That's I'm just going to go. Marathon. I might even ride a mountain bike out there and just, just ride It'll it. prove. I'm telling you, it's going to. Be grindy as fuck. Yeah. Bro, it'll be more to, like, a better lesson to grind it out when you complete it. Be like, if, like, kind of like Goggins. is Like, yeah. you have so much more in the tank than you're capable of. Yeah. That's all I'm doing it just for. Just grind it out, dude. Like, I just yeah, want train, a hard day. You're in good enough shape already to be fine. Maybe not in yeah. one particular thing, but you'll be fine. Yeah, I'll be fine. Step by step. Yeah. Swim by swim. Arm by yeah, just arm. just one thing at a time. Pedal by pedal. I always go, I I always do the, the hard thing. So if like, sometimes I'll compete with guys after a really hard chest tries day, say, all right, we got to do a hundred pushups and you only get three sets to do it. You know, at the end of the workout, you're crushed. Mm -hmm. People are like, man, a hundred pushups. They think about counting to a hundred. You know what I count Mm -hmm. to? All right. How many times do I got to count to 10? Oh, right, right, right. And that's how I do it. I count to 10. All right. I'm going to count to 10 five times right here. Boom. 50 pushups. All right. Now I'm going to count to 10 four times. Boom. 40 push-ups. You're going to count to 10 once. Boom. 100 push-ups. So you mean to tell me when there's an end goal and you compartmentalize it down <laughs> into a single, smaller, more accomplishable goal. It simplifies the game. That eventually you get the big goal? Yep. Wouldn't you yeah. know it? Yeah. That was great. That yeah. is, uh, that's about all my mind can handle right now. Me too. Um, it was really special. Dom, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Don't Lucas. think it's going to be the last time that we do this. And, There's so much value um, inside you that you don't even know you have uh, to provide to others um, just with your mind and and the life that you live. So continue to pour more out on others, even when you feel depleted, and make sure you get the time to go fill up that water Mm -hmm. and go fill up that glass to continue to pour out more because your abundance that's coming to you is because of how much you've poured out. So continue to pour out on others, continue to give, and it's okay if you don't feel like it's coming back in return right away. It's coming back in a, in a tenfold. And just know that that's coming because the energy you put out in the world is contagious and people love you and people look up to you. I'm one of those people and I'm just incredibly fortunate to have you in my life. So well, I love you. Thank and you. I'm excited for you to be on a stage one day with 100,000 mm-hmm. people in the audience Thank you. that need your help mm. because I've been there and I went to 10X Growth Con and it was two thousand dollars. I didn't know what to expect. Ed Milet was there. Ed Milet was the first time I ever seen him, and just hearing him, it was what I needed. Mm. And you're gonna do that for thousands of people. Wait, we got to tell the Ed Milet story. I can't. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so All this right, is right. good. So this is good. Yeah. Ed, you're gonna hear this, by the way. So 
we're at a 4th of July party, and this is talking about shooting your shot. We're at a 4th of July party. Wait, a, what do you have to lose? In, in a backyard. You never done it. And I, I go up to Dom. We're, I'm going to start DMing girls now, Ed. Yeah. All because of you. All right, anyway. Keep so going. anyways, so Ed, you're going to hear this. We're at a 4th of July party, and I'm sitting down with Dom, and we're breaking down all these guys that are influential in our life that we're seeing on social media. We're, we're grabbing their content, doing something with their content. And I start talking about this guy, Ed Milet, to Dom. And this is right when he's probably like a 500,000 follower guy. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've heard of this guy. He's a good guy, this and that. Yeah, I like his stuff too. And I was like, you want to hear something crazy? I said, I was in the car driving with my dad, and he was interviewing Eric Thomas. And he was interviewing Eric Thomas, and I paused it. We were sitting in traffic going to my brother's playoff baseball game in high school. And I paused it, and I said, Dad, I don't know what it is about this guy, but I have this really weird feeling that he's going to be a mentor of mine. And he looked at me, you know, in Big Tom's fashion, he just kind of clicked play and looked at me. He's like, hey, if you believe it, it'll come true. And I was like, huh. And I just looked out the window sitting in that traffic, and I was, it, it hit me. So I was really moved to go home and research this guy. And so I researched him, and I found out that he had played baseball at the place that I was going to play at. He had played at University of Pacific. And I was like, no way. How is this real? Like, out of all the places he could have... And the fact he played college baseball. I didn't even know that. I looked it up, and I found it out, and I was like, what? And so I called the coaches, and I was like, do you know you have an alumni that is doing this? Do you guys know about this guy? And they're like, no, we have no idea. I was like, are you kidding me? You don't know this? This guy's got probably close to a billion dollars. He He's more than that. He's He's can change your life. He can change your program. He can train, yeah. change everything about the way we do things here. Yeah. And they're like, oh, wow, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, typical guys that never looked into anything. And so I'm telling Dom this story. I'm telling you this story at a 4th of July, and you're like, well, why don't you rip him a DM? I was like, there's no way this guy replies to a DM. And we ripped him a DM, and you were really strategic on how you placed it. You wrote it in my yeah, phone. It, yeah. Boom, sent it. We're sitting at the 4th of July party. And he says, hey, brother, thanks for reaching out. Haven't had anyone from Pacific reach out in a long time. And I was like, Dom, he replied. And he was like, no way, he replied. Yeah. And fast forward three months, he comes up. He gives a talk to our team that was yep. probably worth $500,000, his his yep. two hours of time. Speaking fee, basically. And, and he yep. does it for free. He flies fly in a private jet. Flies in his that. jet yep. and gives a speech. But one thing I'm going to call you out for, Ed, he – he gives that speech. He puts it on a podcast and his number one downloaded podcast at that time was his speech. And it was called fueling your flame. And it was unbelievably impact impactful. Um, the way he just, his presence was so freaking strong. He entered that room and we were like, Whoa. And then he just hit us and hit us and hit us and hit us and hit us with it. And it truly changed the culture on the way people went about their business because they were so inspired by it. And someone that has that kind of power, it's so powerful that you almost have to be careful with it. Because I could only imagine how drained he was at the end of that talk. Mm -hmm. He gave so much. He gave so much in that hour because it. I still remember what he said and every part of it and the way he went about it. And for me as a strategic thinker and doing what he does – is is inspiration for me. I love the way he impacts lives, and and that's what I want to do. And when I hired someone, he was wondering how much money we were making and how he was going to make money and and where was this going to go. And he was in a similar space, but he wanted to work for me. And I told him, I said, hey, look, man. I said, this is the number, but this is the percent of impact I've made. When I make this percent of impact, this number will sky to infinite. And he was like, I said, quit focusing on the bottom line and start focusing on the impact and see where that's going to take you. He reports back. It's funny. He sends me a text every month. He goes, hey, first month after your coaching, I'm up 35% in income. I said, are you worried about your income or are you worried about your impact? Impact. How are you talking to people? What kind of culture are you bringing to a place? What kind of environment are you creating when you show up? Okay. How can you refine your language? How can you show up and be a better person for that person? Okay. I'll continue to work on that. Hey, from that 35% increase, I'm up another 11% since you started coaching me. So he's up 46% in monthly income from taking that advice. And I told him to stop focusing on the bottom line and start focusing on the impact. And that's what Ed has done. 
Ed has transitioned from his marketplace value to his inner value, and it's made his impact skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And his impact has skyrocketed, and I'm sure his income has too. Mm -hmm. Um, So, Ed, I hope you heard that story because uh, that was how we connected. That's how you got to UOP. And that is where your number one podcast started right there. Insane. It is insane. But that's uh, a yeah, great that, story. That's that's enough for today. Can't shoot. You don't shoot. You don't score. And you shot the shot on my phone. <laughs> so I appreciate that. No worries, brother. Love you. Love thank you. you for having me. This, thank you, Lucas, for yeah. putting this together. Yeah. You're uh, what's the guy on Joe Rogan's? Thanks, Jamie. Jamie, yeah. Thanks, Jamie, Jamie. pull that up for yeah. me. <laughs> it's, Thanks, like a, it's like a lion eating the shit out of a gazelle. Jamie. Yeah. Oh, that's sick, Jamie. Hey, Lucas. <laughs> Lucas, pull up that uh, UFO, that alien. Yeah. Uh, like, holy shit. Good job, Lucas. Yep. yep. 100 in. All right, love you.